you lying? <laughs> they not ready. Oh, Welcome to Real Talk Radio. The show that says just because you don't attend with them does not mean that you're not in him. The him being Jesus. The show that plants seeds and water seeds, but God gives the increase. Let's talk about it on Real Talk Radio. This show is a continuation of the church folk revolution. Enjoy the show. Good morning, good morning to everybody. Welcome to Real Talk Radio, the show that says just because you do not attend with them does not mean that you're not in him, the him being Jesus. We got the brothers on the line right now, they on their mobiles. Uh, <laughs> they had their, their specific locations doing some business, but we're going to continue with the show as usual. Good morning, well, fellas. Yeah, yeah. How y'all doing? <laughs> oh, I'm blessed and highly favored, brother. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Blessed when I'm coming, blessed when I'm going. I am blessed. <laughs> my father on the cattle on a thousand hills, and whatever I put my hand to shall prosper. I'm the head, not the tail, above, not beneath. How y'all doing? <laughs> uh, well, we good. I mean, we, I think we all right. We, we don't have to say anything else after that. <laughs> but I love I love that man. That's that's you know that's the normal, you know, <laughs> way people usually respond on sun, respond on Sunday mornings when you ask somebody how they're doing. How they doing? <laughs> no yeah, one, yeah, yeah. No one. Everything in their life is broken. <laughs> you know those man, look at you. About to get they look at you up and down like you know what they're telling you. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, man. Let's let's go ahead. We have a a, a very good. Excellent topic today, man. One that I think is going to be really uh, helpful to a lot of people. But before we dive in, uh, John, you feel like praying today? How's your anointing, bro? You got it today? No, it's a little low today. Um, let me try to bring it back up. I'm gonna work it out. I'm gonna get this. Uh, Set the atmosphere. Get some Set praise and worship. Yeah, you gotta get some praise and worship going so I can raise my anointing level up. Because uh, there's a shifting right. taking place right now. All right. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, coming to you, thanking you for another day, thanking you for waking us up this morning and allowing us to be on this radio show to discuss your word, discuss uh, the things we're going to discuss today. We ask that you use us as vessels, God. We ask that um, that the hearers hear what the Spirit is saying, and we know that we are nothing without you. We can do nothing without you, and we call on you to um, use us, God. And bless this show in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Jonathan, man, this was a topic that you hit us up with to uh, something that was on your heart to discuss. Brother, why don't you go ahead and summarize what the show is about today? Yeah, it's it's the uh, the world view of the American Christian, but not just the American Christian. I'll say the westernized. Christian, uh, you know, from our nation, from the West, and how we view Christianity through our lens, and we want every Christian around the world to accept things the way we think they should be done, and it's not just in the church, but just our thinking pattern, period, just our world view, you can do it, look at the politics, we want everybody to be a democracy. Uh, we want all everybody to be free. We want how they say that America is the world's police. How we think we're the world's police, uh, and we're not talking about Syria, but just our outlook on things. And if they're not doing it our way, the way we do it, then apparently they're wrong. Uh, so we want to talk about that, uh, how we view, how we, uh, I guess, leadership, church in general. Um, we're talk about other things like persecution. Um, you know, we think over here that persecution means somebody's talking about you. Uh, they don't wrote a nasty article about you. Um, they putting their mouth on a man of God, and we call that persecution. But people are being pers- like literally, seriously being persecuted. No one over here is 
dying because they profess Christ. Now, I ain't going to say no one because it may be happening. But we are free here in the West to uh, praise and worship God the way we see fit. If we want to go to church, you can go to church. If you don't want to go to church, I mean, worship them how you want. And you got a lot of people in a lot of other countries who don't have that freedom. And they, you know, sometimes risk their lives for the gospel, just as it was in the early church. Um, but just our out view, our outlook is is being exported across the world. You can see in uh, a lot of the African nations where you have mm-hmm. a lot of these word of faith teachers, a lot of these word of faith people giving millions. I was reading something, some this guy named Joshua TB or something like that, TB Joshua or something. And he said, had his Miracle Faith Water 2.0, so he upgraded his Miracle Faith Water. People <laughs> actually died. They were, he was giving it out or selling or whatever, and two people died because there was a riot and people trying to get this Miracle Faith Water 2.0. Um, it just, it's just greed that's being exported across the world. Um, and it's just our outview, man, our outlook. Where did this Word of Faith stuff come from? Uh, and we, we just want to deal with Stuff like that today, so we're gonna we're gonna hit it hard, man. Okay. Now, when when we say world view, just to, to give people an understanding of that, because this is a topic like many of the topics that we we've addressed on this show that oftentimes people are not aware of. Uh, these are not topics that you're going to hear oftentimes in your everyday uh, church sort circle. You know, you and your church friends are not going to be sitting around most times having conversations about dominionism, uh, Christian or biblical worldviews. You're, you're not going to have those type of conversations. That's just the way it is for whatever reason. But when we think of the American Christian worldview, there's one word that pretty much sums it up, and that would be arrogance. Uh, mm. Just about anything that we can attribute to the way people outside of America looks at America uh, would be arrogance would be one of the first definitions that would come out of their mouth. We have such a way of viewing ourselves, whether intentionally or unintentionally, as being better than we are. Now, uh-huh. no one's going to dispute that America's uh, not a great country. We're not going to sit here and argue that America is this or that. We we understand that America is a great country. It has great benefits that many other countries do not have. But you will be fooling yourself to think that America does not have dirty and bloody hands from some of the things that they have done throughout history and continue to do. So let's 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 uh-huh. make sure we keep it real here. We're not going to place America on some pedestal to give people this idea that we are just a perfect nation because we are far from it. But the worldview, when you think of worldview, worldview would be like the lenses that you look out other things with. So worldview would be essentially how you see other things. Mm -hmm. In the American worldview, we see things the way Jonathan was describing it as uh, we deserve these things that whether we want to uh-huh. acknowledge it or not, that we're better than other countries. Uh, it's just amazing how, and these things are attributed by our education that we've had, our upbringing, the culture we live in, books we read, the media, movies. But we have to make sure that we change it, or not necessarily change it, but begin to look at things from a Christ centered worldview which goes completely polar opposite to the American worldview. So we're gonna hit that. And I want people mm-hmm. to understand that when we deal with this topic today, it is gonna be a topic that you're gonna to have to sit back and be like, Man, I really have become a very arrogant, uh, self righteous Christian on many levels because I feel like I deserve to have a particular thing based off of where I am in this world. So, John, mm-hmm. I want you to add your perspective too, bro. Go ahead. And one other thing that we might hit on is this uh, American patriotism. Um, you know, you might not go too deep into that because that's a show all in and of itself. This American patriotism where uh, we have made America so special and so great 
you know, we've added America to the uh, the prophecy. We've uh, made America, you know, the the promised land of uh, you know where where we just so America just so important in God's eyes. And so we we want to tackle that uh, a little bit too. Yeah, and and, and I think we, we have to look at it's just the mindset. A lot of times, how even us in America, how we look at rich people, and how we think that rich people look down on poor people, and how we're better than them, and we got this and we got that, and it's just that that arrogant superiority mindset that you know our way is better. You should do things like this because it, it's it's better. Um, I, I remember watching a TV show. I think it's it's it called Hell on Wheels. Um, it's mm-hmm. set back in right after the Civil War, and they build the sure. railroads, and they're going through Indian country, Indian territory, and all this stuff. And the uh, Indians in America have actually sat down to have a talk, and the Americans didn't understand how or why the Indians did not want to wear their clothes, did not want to live in the same mm-hmm. type of buildings that they lived in. They did not. You know, want to eat their food. The Indians were uh, content to live how they were living, and they didn't need or want the Americans to come and change that up. But the Americans, in their arrogance, said, "No, our way is better. You should do it like us." And we see the same thing in the American Christians worldview on how we view Christ, how we view fellowship. Mm-hmm how we view church, the building, how we view leadership, all this stuff, and it's it's the same. There's no difference. And I think it's just us as Americans or just the – now, we keep talking about America, but it's the whole West, period, the whole mm-hmm. Western mm-hmm. culture. And you think about the uh, arms races. You had uh, uh, communism over in Russia, and you had democracy over here. They have big going back and forth. How they even with Vietnam, what happened in Vietnam, and even in North Korea, you have those conflicts where America didn't want communism to be in those countries, Russia didn't want democracy to be in those countries, so they backed certain factions. I mean, you can see it, and it's the same thing, man. You can always better, do it our way because we know better, we know right, and you see the same thing going on uh, with things of Christ. Yes, and and let me give a definition of what arrogance is for people to understand it, because I think we may have a, a general rough idea of it. But arrogance is described as an insulting way of thinking or behaving that comes from believing that you are better, smarter, or more important than other people. Let, let me let me read it one more time. An insulting way of thinking or behaving that comes from believing that you are better, smarter, or more important than other people. Now, and one of the ways that I've often seen this mentality attributed to the westernized church view is through missionaries. Now, before anybody gets they, you know, their spiritual draws all in a bunch and start feeling like, you know, we're coming against missionaries or whatever, listen to what we're going to say fully and understand our heart. I don't have an issue with missionaries, okay? My issue tends to be with missionaries is how we tend to feel like we have all the answers for other countries, we we have all the, the things that these other countries need, so we take what we have here to give to other countries. Now, the issue that I always have with missionaries or overseas things that we tend to do in other countries is why are we going to other places when our own have issues, when we have all these problems and things taking place in our own crib, why are we not working here? And it's so funny that I read this uh, this article one time, and it was from this Asian country, and they were talking about how they had begun to send Christian missionaries to America to mm-hmm. preach the gospel here. 
and it was mm-hmm. it was it was really a uh, an eye opening statement to to read that, and I was like, man, what a interesting perspective that that country has upon us. Well, we feel like here in America, you know, we got it all together. You know what I mean? We got all this. We got democracy. You know what I mean? We got all these great things, technology, yada, yada, yada. But this other country who is looking at us from the outside is like, man, they don't understand how truly vile and evil some of their ways really are. That they were to the point where they were sending from their country to our country to evangelize to us. And they don't have the same type of freedom in that Asian country where in many of the Asian countries, you you cannot under any circumstance profess Christ. You know, folk are jumping on Facebook all morning long this morning talking about come to my church, it's national comeback to church day and join us. Man, in those Asian countries, you are being killed for, I mean, killed death. Shot in the head for professing Christ, but they're willing to sacrifice that to send people to America. That was just profound to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I got a, a little, just a little different view from missionaries in Elgin. I, I look at it as some people just might be called overseas. Um, and that just might be their calling. They may not be called to because you know Peter had was called to the Gentiles. No, no, Paul was called to the Gentiles and Peter. You know, they was had different callings, so I can't just, you know, I wouldn't just make a blanket statement saying, you know, we got to hear. No, 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 no. Please, and here. please don't, please don't make it seem like that. If I came across that way, okay, I that, apologize. That, I'm that, not. It is, no. come off. Okay, okay, I got I'm you. I'm not um, saying that in any sense of the word. Okay, I got you. Um, also, we have um, talking about missionaries coming here, and like you know, Elder was saying, a lot of these people. From other countries, they can see the wickedness because they're not brainwashed like we are to ignore all the bad stuff and just look at look at all the freedoms we have. Look at all the freedoms we have. They're not as brainwashed as we are, and they can see it. Um, uh, I know, you know, guys from Africa, from you know the continent of Africa, different countries send lots of missionaries to America. And he's like, why does America need missionaries? What? And don't we hear the gospel? Uh, apparently not. We're hearing something. We're hearing a different gospel. And like Elder said, the fact that they would even think that they need to send missionaries to America should speak loudly. Mm-hmm. That should be a wake up call. That should be a, to Christians that are here. Mm-hmm. And, a when you, and when you think about that inside the American church, when we first hear something like that, we get offended on the inside. We really get offended. What? What do you mean you got to send missionaries here? You know, that just goes straight to that point that we Elder was talking about earlier about the arrogance. You know, we just get so um, so uptight when somebody challenges us or, or calls us or calls our way of life into question. And speaking just. Continuing on with the conversation, when we look at the arrogance of I'm right and everybody else is wrong, look at the different denominations inside the church and how every denomination thinks that they have the answer. They think that they have it right and everybody else is wrong. That's pure arrogance. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it's such a a, a a issue because it's often uh, not seen. We don't realize that we have that arrogant mentality. We we don't grasp that fact that we we have that level of arrogance. We because we are only able to see one perspective because we live within that worldview. But we have to be able to look at it from, again, a biblical worldview to see if what we are saying about us, the fact that people actually believe that somewhere in Scripture there is prophecy specifically for America, if that right there in itself doesn't reek of arrogance, nothing else will. I mean, just just, just somehow to think 
that God specifically wrote in America into the scriptures as, as some form of prophecy that it, it just blows my mind how people come up with that stuff. And there are mega church pastors who have built their whole their whole uh doctrine and theology and everything regarding uh their particular aspect of Christianity off of the fact of how America is this great biblical empire. If you ever heard of this cat named John Hagee who is constantly preaching about how great America is and how we must ally and, and rally around Israel and how we must protect them and all these things because it, it, and it, it reeks of arrogance. It's just unbelievable. John, where you at? You with us, too? Fellas, y'all still there? Okay. I seem to have lost y'all, but oh, maybe I'm where y'all are. Oh, okay. Okay. My bad. What's your... I muted my phone. Um, what was you just saying? I was speaking you on John I had a train of thought, and I lost it. Okay. I was speaking about John Hagee and how he has built his whole theology and doctrine off of how dominant and wonderful America is and how he has essentially forced his congregation to rally around uh, Israel as a way of protecting Israel and keeping Israel that peace, but how they have breathed in and wrote America into Scripture. Mm, Yeah. And that's truly just even thinking about that, how you can see the arrogance in that, how they look at Israel as a little brother. We got to protect our little brother no matter what. You know, that's that's our job. We got to go and protect them. You know, we can't evangelize them. That's John Hagee's teaching. We, we don't need to evangelize them because according to him, they have their own separate covenant with God. They got their own covenant. So we... You don't need to worry about evangelizing them, but we just got to protect them. You got to protect God's holy land. And it's really uh, what you call it, heresy what, he, what he's preaching. Um, but just looking at how a lot of the, the Jewish people are willing to uh, sit there and, I won't say accept that, they'll take the help, but they really don't care for us. They don't care for yeah, the American they really church. Don't. They'll really use um, people like John Hagee, but they really don't have an understanding of that we are all supposed to be one body regardless of your natural birth. Your natural birth don't make you a child of God. It's your spiritual birth that does. Exactly. That's a really, that's a really good point too, man, is that it, it's our spiritual birth that brings us in. And Jonathan, your mic is live with us, bro. Too, you're on the air with us. Uh, it's our spiritual birth that brings us into the body, not our physical birth or our physical location, i.e., America. Jonathan, can you hear me, bro? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. I'm okay, good. bro. You're, you're on the air. You're live with us. So go ahead and share your thoughts, man. Um, I was just transitioning, so pass over me. <laughs> I was transitioning, man. I had to get okay, my phone. Okay, you know? bro. Okay, okay. I, I know, but you sound like a fool just now. So come <laughs> on, man. John, go ahead, bro. Let's let's keep the show rolling. Now, let's go back. Let's go back to the American church and how. Uh, how even the American church, how we view, not we, I'm going to say they, how they view those of us who don't worship the way that they worship. And like the beginning of our show, you know, uh, we're in the show that said just because you don't uh, worship with them, I forgot what it even says, don't mean that you're not uh, in him. They get upset. Mm-hmm. What do you mean you don't go to church? Just have a decent conversation with somebody, and they find out that you don't go to church. The first thing that happens 
is you'll notice, what What you mean you don't go to church? You're a Christian? Why you don't mm-hmm. go to church? And they look down on you. Well, you got to come to my church. My pastor is great. And they're always pumping up their pastor, and they're always pumping up church. But very seldom do you hear them pumping up Christ. That's, yeah. Very, yeah. that's an issue. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I mean, just I, I was just saying because that, that's so true, man. Because you can't. It's hard to even explain to people, like how you can have a relationship with Christ without church, and they just don't get it. But they don't know that's millions and millions of Christians around the world who never stepped foot in the church building. Now the early and. <sighs> The early church, if you read in scriptures, they didn't have, like you just say, the church of Corinth or the church of Ephesus. And what people automatically read into is that, and they, like they said, they listen at that through their American westernized worldview lenses. And that's how they're reading the scripture. So when they read the church of Ephesus or the church of Corinth, they're thinking of a building where Paul was the pastor or somebody else was the pastor and things were going on. And what they're not really understanding is he's talking about the community of believers in the city of Corinth. All the believers of the city of Corinth were the, and I hate you know, were the church of Corinth. Mm -hmm. All of them, not just one particular building. And we can't uh, 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 separate that fact with our Christianized, American, westernized worldview. We can't make that distinction that he's not talking about a building down on the corner of Hosea and Joseph Street. No. That is, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to piggyback on that, man, because that is probably one of the most difficult conversations to have with somebody and regarding when your lack of church membership and attendance, they cannot grasp how you, and I know I'm just reiterating what you just said, but I want people to understand that they cannot grasp how one can have a fruitful, growing, sustained, strong relationship with Christ without attending a building. So to try mm-hmm. to get somebody to understand, yes, I, I, I love me some Jesus, I, and I, I know I'm saved, and I and I don't go to church. They, they cannot grasp, and in their mind, they're, you are in violation somehow. You, you mm-hmm. Based off of yep. their world view, yep. the way they vision it and they see it, you are not. But then, again, stepping out of the American context, what do you say to those who cannot? Because if they do, their life is put in danger. And I bet there are some who are just arrogant enough, fellas, to say, well, they should go anyway. They, they should try to go to a church anyway, and, and God will yep. protect them. And, and yep. they should have enough. They should have more faith. That is one of the most foolish, ignorant arrogant statements that people can make and they make on a daily basis when they come to this assumption that you are not able to have a relationship with Christ. So there are people right now who had to work, had to work today, so they could not attend church. They are sitting somewhere based off of their worldview, feeling some type of way, placing themselves under self-condemnation because they're not able to attend church today. Oh, I, oh man, my relationship with Jesus is not going to be the same because I got to work, or I feel so bad, or Jesus feels. It's 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 that worldview that we have mm-hmm. that really has placed us in in this this mindset that we're not worthy, or God is not good enough, or you're not good enough because you're not practicing the kind of faith that American or the Westernized view has said we have to practice. That's mm-hmm. nuts. And the opposite of that is true too. Um, they think because they go that they're blessed, because they go that their relationship is better. How many times have you heard her say, uh, you know, I went to church and now my, I feel all, I feel much better. I feel, uh, you know, my week going to be blessed because I went to church. So the reverse is just as true. Um, and I think where it comes, where that 
idea comes from is the fact that they cannot separate church from Christ. To them, that is Christ. That's an idol. They have created an idol thinking that them going to church is them serving Christ. Them being inside that building is them serving Christ. They cannot separate your relationship with Christ from that building. If you can't go to building, your relationship is strained. And that's the issue. That's the issue. And they claim that the church is the house of God. And I cannot tell you how many times we've had this discussion. I mean, Jonathan Elgin, how many times have y'all had a discussion about the church building being the house of God? We're going to dedicate this to the house of God. I mean, we're going to dedicate this building. This is now the house of God. When you walk into a church, you got to be quiet. You got to respect. You got to have reverence for the house of God. And inside the house of God, you got the pulpit, which is the holiest of holies, which is so um, so respectful. Only certain people can go up in there. Uh, if you go up in there, or a child go up in there, or somebody that just finished smoking cigarettes walk up in the pulpit, or oh, they haven't filed the temple. You know, you cuss in church. You, they don't defile the temple. You know, it's just pure. Um, it's idol worship. Basically, that's really what it is. And, and another aspect that I wanted to, you know, you know, we talked about was this feeling where we get where we're owed something, like uh, entitlement, this sense of entitlement. We believe because we are here in America that we deserve to be healed all the time. That we're not going to get sick, especially if you're a Christian. You are, I'm a child of the king. You know how many times I heard that? I'm a child of the king. So I'm not supposed to be walking around here looking like a pauper. I'm not supposed to be broke. I'm not supposed to be sick. I'm not supposed to be uh, down and out. I'm not supposed to have no problems, no issues, no struggles because I'm a child of the king. I'm a king's son. I'm a king's daughter. And it, it it's sad that we have this mentality, a uh, sense of entitlement, and, and we try to put it on God, put it on Jesus. But if you look throughout the scripture, let's look, look talk about a revelation where Jesus said, you know, uh, blessed are the poor. He said, the poor will be with you always. And he's talking to one of the churches in, in the book of Revelation where he said that, um, that you are maybe poor, you know, in, in the physical, but you are, are rich in the spirit. Did he say, I'm going to give you all this money? No, he didn't. He didn't. Matter of fact, look at Peter. Was it Peter and, and, and John, I think? And they were walking and they seen the man and he said, uh, give us some money. And what did Peter say? He said, silver and gold have I none. So he didn't have no money. He didn't have no money. He was broke. The great apostle Peter. Peter. rich, right? Now, he walked with Jesus, yet he was broke. Silver and gold, I had none. But what I have, I give unto you. But he was the apostle, the mighty man of God, healing folks, doing all this. But he was broke. So we think that we're supposed to be rich because this is what has been told to us. We have not really studied, and that's what our worldview is. So we think just because you're a Christian, you're supposed to not get sick. You're not supposed to, um, you're supposed to be healthy all the time. You're not supposed to be broke, broke down. And nothing, none of the stuff, stuff is supposed to happen to you. And that is another form of arrogance. And here's here's one of the things that we want to make sure the listeners are understanding. You, oftentimes when you listen to Real Talk Radio, you're going to hear us use the church and pastors as examples and when we're describing and de- dealing with certain situations. Don't take us talking about them as a form of hatred or dislike for them. What we're saying is nothing should be in the way of your relationship with Christ. And unfortunately, many times the church system stands as an idol and is a hindrance to your growth in Christ. So understand that aspect. And here's what I like to ask people. If for whatever reason all of the churches in the westernized world closed down, it would just 
I would love to see what people's relationships would be like with Christ without being able to get up and attend a church. What would their relationship be like that? It would force people to study to show thyself approved instead of having a codependent relationship with the system. Mm-hmm. And I know some people are, are, are going in because they genuinely have a love for their their church, and that's understandable. But what we always say is be careful and don't place anything in the throne seat, in the very seat that only Jesus should be sitting in. And unfortunately, some people don't want to acknowledge or realize that there are other things that sit in that seat. Mm. So how, how, can, how can we show them? And it is vexing to, I mean, because we, we see, for you, not that we have arrived in nothing like that, but some things we just know we can walk in our freedom. And you can see, it's almost like talking to a teenager who thinks he knows it all. But you, you, I mean, you probably can't remember the last 10 years of your life. You don't know nothing. You have no life experience. Um, and I'm just using an example here, how teenagers are smug, arrogant, they know it all. The parents don't know nothing. They're just old, fuddy duddies. Um, and and that's how sometimes I look at a lot of Christians who persist on labeling us as evil, bad, church haters, pastor haters, and all this different kind of stuff because we speak this truth that can be found in Scripture. Um, and they, they refuse to go research it for themselves. They refuse. Or when they do research it, they're looking at it with their, their lenses on westernized, the- rose-colored lenses, that it has to be this way. Mm-hmm. It has to be this way. So let, let's talk about persecution here for a minute. Oh, wow. Because, I mean, we we, we hit on it Ooh. a couple of times, but like I said when I first when we first came on, nobody over here is really dying. I'll say on a daily basis, persecuted. I mean, we have the right to assemble. Uh, we have the re- right to religious freedom. But you, you, you try to go to Saudi Arabia and call yourself a Christian and think you're going to open up a church. Man, and you'll be a fool to believe that there are no Christians over in that uh, Muslim country. You'd be a fool to think that. Now, these guys, if they try to open up a church, are being persecuted. They are, will be. Now, let's talk about the Sudan, which has been going on for years and years and years, where Muslims are killing Christians, have been killing Christians. But America, we want to run over to Syria, but we, you know, we, Sudan, well, yeah, yeah. There's nothing that we can gain from helping the the Christians in Sudan. But you know, we ain't trying to get political here. But the fact remains that those Christians over in Sudan have been targeted because they're Christian. They mm-hmm. are being literally persecuted for the sake of the gospel. Now us over here. We be persecuted, you know, but we would like to think that we are, but we have no clue. I have no clue because that hasn't happened to me. And it's and it's really it's really sad how the westernized culture, particularly the media, has portrayed and whether intentionally or unintentionally placed American. And I I, I keep harping on America because I see it so prevalent here how they have placed us in this position that we have all of the answers and how all of these other countries are essentially beneath us. There's a, a website out there that I used to get the email newsletter from all the time, but I stopped getting it because it was just way so heavy on me reading some of the stories. It's called The Voice of the Martyrs. Mm-hmm. And uh, the whole website is created and designed to uh, – not glorify or even highlight the persecution that takes place in other countries, but to give people uh, a way of reaching out to these countries, to giving to these countries, to pray for these countries, but to give them insight on what's taking place over in these countries. 
And the website is www.persecution.com. And if you take a minute and you go there and you read some of the things that you see, you will just be absolutely floored when it comes to what these people who profess a love for Christ that is almost unseen here in the westernized culture. It ain't too many of us who would actually be trying to go to a symbol under the threat of death. Mm-hmm. And literally, sneaking around at nighttime, you know, they have on Monday night, they have it scheduled at 3 a.m., for them to meet and pray and to read a tattered Bible that's missing pages uh, under one candle, all of these people huddled in this run room. And then the following night, they meet at, you know, 1 p.m. at somebody else's house reading this same tattered Bible, you know, hiding, having lookouts. And then the next night, they meet at a different time all under the threat that if they are heard or seen gathering like this or possessing this Bible, that they would all be killed. It's not too many of us who would try to gather like that. We, mm-hmm. In our westernized culture, we are not trying to go to certain churches that don't let us wear jeans. Mm-hmm. Oh, you got to wear a dress to go to that church? Oh, no, I ain't going. Because I want to be able to feel comfortable in my worship. I, I I can't I can't wear jewelry. I can't do this. Oh, I'm not going there because I cannot be comfortable. But these people are underneath the threat of death. That's persecution. You not being able to wear some doggone jeans is a preference. Mm-mm. Which is completely different. Do you see the arrogance there? And it, it's just mind blowing. And again, that website is www.persecution.com. Man, take a minute and go through there and scroll and read some of those stories and just have the Spirit deal with your heart and your arrogance. Because, guess, best believe, it's in there. So, have either of y'all read the Fox book, Fox's Book of Martyrs? I haven't. I start. I've started reading some of it, but again, it was. It's just. It's a real heavy read. It's not an easy read because it's not a good story. When I say it's not a good story, I'm meaning uh, the only happy endings in this story is to know that these people are in glory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you can you can look through scripture. And see how a lot of people were martyred and really persecuted for what they believe in. Paul, or should I say Saul, persecuted the church. And he said it dragged men and women in chains because they professed Jesus. He did this for years. Matter of fact, he was standing there when Stephen was stoned to death. Bro, he was stoned. He wasn't, only, he wasn't only standing there, he was holding the cloaks. Of the dudes who were stoning Stephen So the dudes who were stoning Stephen Gave Saul Their jackets So yo, hold, my, hold, hold my coat I need to loosen up I need to get ready while he was And the whole time that Stephen is being stoned He's preaching the gospel mm-hmm. As the rocks is banging him against his head He is preaching Christ That right there then That's some persecution for you bro now, who among us has went through anything like that? Who among us has has done anything like that? But we, we believe that because we want to pass laws, now that they're, now they're saying the church has got to marry homosexuals, that the church is being persecuted. We we want to believe they're passing laws uh, about 501c3, and, and now they, they want to, uh, the government want to look into the, the spending habits of the churches that they're being persecuted. You know, everything is a persecution. Everybody, they persecuting Eddie Long because he's a strong man of God. No, it ain't persecution, man. But through all our lenses, through the way we read Scripture and the way we interpret Scripture, through our worldview, the American, our westernized worldview, that's what it is. But we have no clue, no idea, none. Yeah. So, Ezra, was the last time you were persecuted 
for the first. And you know what? And, and uh, you know, we joke around a lot. And this show may seem to be a little more serious than you used to for us, but it, it, it's, it's the truth. Now, we get talked about so bad, but people don't like us. And the people who don't like us are the people who are supposed to be our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, how is that for irony? The world, you know, they, I ain't going to say the world loves us, but they can understand what we're saying. But the people who we trying to set free, trying to open their eyes, the people who we want to plant seeds with and water seeds with, they're the ones who dismiss us the ones who talk about us, the ones who dog us out. They, they are the worst ones. They say we blind. They say we, we just church haters and all this different stuff. But they, it's I never, frustrating, man. I didn't come into doing, I think when we all began to do the show, we all came in realizing there was going to be a level of uh, adversity to doing the show. We, we knew that we were up against some challenges. We knew that there were going to be some topics that we would deal with, that we would talk about, that would bring uh, a certain spotlight to us. We, we knew that there would be a certain type of uh, people who would come against our show. We, we, we understood that. But I think for me personally, I didn't expect it to be at times – the level of, and I, I want to say, I don't want to say, yeah, vehemence would be the perfect word because I almost said hatred. The level of vehemence that we have faced because of this topic. Because one of the things that we we have learned is you cannot, there's some things, some topics that you really can't talk about. There are some sacred cows that people really are just uncomfortable with talking about. Uh, race is one of them, sex is another, and talking about people's money is another one. And But now we have learned that talking about the church, boy, mm-hmm. it, that's, that's, that's one of them topics right there that you really should not, in many people's eyes, talk about because it's God's church, and God will take care of it, mm-hmm. which we, we agree to a certain extent but also knowing that we are ministers of reconciliation, knowing what our responsibility is, and reading Scripture for ourselves, we know that in this walk there will be a level of suffering that we will face. Scripture doesn't describe what that suffering will be on an individual basis, but he does say, listen, you're going to go through some things. It's some stuff that you're going to have to deal with. Now, I'm not going to give you a laundry list of what it's going to be, but me warning you here should let you know at some point in time, your life will not be easy because you profess a faith in me. Mm-hmm. It will not be easy. But <laughs> that ain't what we taught, man. We taught that we're going to have an easy life. Everything's supposed to be good. The street's supposed to be paved with gold. We ain't never supposed to get sick. We all supposed to have money. They're supposed to magically appear from heaven. But take that, Jonathan, and let's apply it like we were talking about early, earlier. Apply it to how other countries, particularly poverty-stricken countries, are taking this westernized worldview and beginning to apply certain false doctrines to their church, i.e. the word of faith movement. How we now see in these particularly poor African nations that are taking the word of faith, name it, claim it, uh, false doctrine, and applying it to their churches, and these people are making money off of this false doctrine. Mm-hmm. Off of the people who don't have nothing. People who don't have no money. Uh, and it, it is, it's crazy, because you can just turn on, you know, you can go to Nigeria. A lot of them are in Nigeria, where you see these guys, and they pass it, and the people are, are hungry for a real God. They're hungry for the real God. They're hungry for Jehovah. But what they're finding is uh, mammon. Explain what that is, bro. Mammon is is is, is, is the God of money, I guess. I don't know. Jesus said, you know, talking about mammon, you know, and I just assume he's the God of money, I guess. Okay. Maybe he's okay. the God of greed or whatever, materialism, mm-hmm. whatever. But they're chasing after mammon, 
and because they really don't know. They don't know. You know, um, but these guys get up, and they sound good. They dress nice. You know, and then they want to uh, uh, be under always promoting the big-time word of faith preachers here. You know, because they see these guys on TV, and we export our garbage, not just uh, like somebody called Baywatch. They said it was garbage. Not just that, but all the, the violent movies, um, uh, the, the sexual movies, all these things. And then you have the uh, TVNs exporting this stuff, and they brag about having satellites all over the world. So you got people all over the world that are hearing this false gospel, this give to get gospel, this you can have it all, get your best life now gospel, and it's being promoted over the world, and people are falling for it. And this is the thing, man. In no way, shape, or form are we telling people to run and leave your church. Right. We're right. not, and, and we're not telling people. For one, the the isolation idea of being a Christian who walks away from the church and tries to do their walk by themselves is foolish. Okay, mm-hmm. it's foolish, and we also believe and contend that it's impossible to do. It's because if you are a Christian, you are part of a larger body of Christ. God will not allow you to walk this walk by yourself. He will send people to you to guide you on your walk. Just think of Mm -hmm. some of the people that you have met incidentally over your walk with Christ that he has sent out of the blue. That you you had no idea that you were going to meet a particular person who had a particular different belief possibly than you do, but have the same foundation as you do that God has sent your way. So the isolation, you trying to do your walk on an island by yourself is an absolute foolish thing. And if anybody ever tells you that you need to leave your church and try to have a relationship with Christ by yourself, you need to reject them and walk away from them immediately because they are breathing something into your life that is absolutely false. And I'm going to give you a primary example. When I walked away willingly Happily, without bitterness, out of the pulpit, I walked to a place where initially I was by myself doing this radio show. But out of the blue, I mean, it it just, to this day, it blows our mind how God has brought the three of us together to do this radio show. I don't, I, I didn't know these two dudes from a can of paint. I, I, I had no idea who John and Jonathan were. But the Spirit led them to reach out to me to say, hey, man, how, what do you think of this idea? And because of who I was in Christ and who Christ is in me, it was like, man, what a great idea. And ever since then, he has continued to lead people our way. We can give you a list of people who God has sent to us or who God has sent us to. So the Mm -hmm. isolation, you know, movement and and thought process, we got to eradicate that. That's impossible when you have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because that's that's what people will say. Well, you can't, if you don't go to church, then, you know, you're going to be on by your island by yourself. You can't do ministry by yourself. No, but who who said anything about being by yourself? Now, it can get lonely sometimes, especially in your city, especially in your city with people who believe like you believe, but they are there. And that's why we have, you know, especially with the advent of the internet, you have that. But let's let's look at look at scripture. Uh, uh, when Paul came out of his religion and walked in his freedom in Christ, he was by himself. He was on the backside of Arabia for three years. Three years he was by himself. But guess what? He came back, and he he didn't come back to religion. Guess where he went to walk in his freedom in Christ. He said, I didn't confer with flesh and blood for three years. It was just him and Jesus. So sometimes it's good to be by yourself, just you and Jesus. Sometimes you got to have that wilderness experience where it's just you and Jesus, where you ain't got no other influences but just you and Jesus. It's just you two. 
Now, I know that may not be as practical now in our society where we live, you know, unless you're a hermit or you're a bachelor or, you know, a single young lady with no kid. It's impossible just to be what I'm talking about when it comes to the spiritual, your spirituality, where you can be, which is you and Jesus. When you got no influences, nobody in your ear, they come to church. It's come, that's going to come back to church Sunday. It's, 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 talk it's about detox, the man. It's detox. Some, and that's, I think, we see that clearly with Paul. I, I, just like you touched on, for three years, homie, three, three years he was by himself, just him and the Lord. There was no fellowship. There was, there was nobody for Paul to bounce ideas off of, for, <laughs> for Paul to say, you know, for him to say, well, you know, I used to do this here with the temple. What do I do now? There, there was nobody. But for some reason, in our mindset, we feel the need that we have to have something or someone when Jesus is enough. Mm. And we, it, it, it is really difficult for us to grasp that. And, and if it sounds like we're being harsh, we're just hammering this point home because that is one of the reasons why people tend to remain in places where they know they should have left a long time ago. Mm-hmm. It's, you, they stay because there's a sense of security in that place that they're at. Yep. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to be alone. Yep. Walk into the unknown. What am I going to do now? And we get that a lot, too. Well, you tell people to leave the church, what are they going to do then? Now what? what or, the, do? or the you have to offer a solution to the problems yeah. that you're offering. Oh, my God. Oh and, my God. And, and listen, we understand what you're saying, but you have to hear mm-hmm. us. We offer a solution every show. The solution is Jesus, trusting him. Mm-hmm. If you're looking for tangible solutions, we are not the people to offer that because we believe that the Holy Spirit is the only tangible thing that a person needs. He will lead and guide you into all truth. Where he leads you at today is the very same place that you are supposed to be in. That, that, that's the belief. We are trying to hammer that home to people that Jesus is enough. Mm-hmm. You don't need anything else. And that's a really scary thing for people to understand. We know it. Yeah. We've been there. Yeah. So that's the point we want to hammer home, man, to let people know yeah. because that's a, a question that we're often faced with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they don't they don't they don't know how to rely on Jesus or just put their that's part of faith. Walking out on faith. Lord, if I leave, what's gonna happen? Just have faith in Christ that he's going to take care of you. And he will lead, like Elgin was saying earlier, he will lead you to uh, people. He will lead people to you. Mm-hmm. He will. But, uh, Either uh, before uh, or after cons- you leave. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think another consequence of our worldview here in the West is, is that thing is to our society now. It's just, just micro society. We want it now. Mm. We want to know right now what mm. God's going to do. We can't wait. Wait? What do you mean wait? Mm. Like, mm. What? Like, what? Three you know, years? I, what? Three in the wilderness? Three three years? Oh I, no, homie, you that, tripping? That that is another uh, uh, side effect of the world view that we have, uh, uh, especially you know when it comes to Christianity. And then you get people who. Who get saved and they want to start preaching the next week? <laughs> <laughs> you want to start preaching the next week? Let's let's look at your boy Mace. Oh man, he quit rapping and within was it a year? Yeah, within a year. I met him two years. It wasn't even he that was long. He was a pastor. He was a pastor in yeah. church. He was a pastor. How? What? Where? When? And why? And you how? You know what I'm saying? Like. That was the first thing I said. But, you know, <laughs> since we're talking about Mace, and, you know, we joke a little bit, but that's just our society, and people accept it. Oh, he's gay. He walked away from all that money and fame, and now he's a pastor. He's so sincere. But, Lord, I missed it. Well, what is he talking about? How, is, is he change, could he be changing his life? I don't know. I can't say if he's changing his life. I ain't listening to none of his sermons. I don't know what he's saying in the pulpit. I don't know. But what I do know is that he fell victim to this worldview that we have that you got to be in church. 
Lord, there's so much to this. The clothing. The clothing aspect. You know, we, we especially here in the black church, a lot of clothing is a fashion show. Sunday is a fashion show. You know, you got to dress your best. You know, so don't be, I think John said you can't, couldn't be in the pulpit. The men couldn't be in the pulpit without a jacket. What? Are you, you defiling the temple? Women, like Elder talked about earlier, women, you know, can't wear pants, they can't wear makeup. Where do they do that at? A lot of churches, obviously. Would you try to take that stuff overseas? Well, you ain't got no building. How does that apply? And let's, 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 Let's go ahead and take a break because I want to deal with uh, how those who are overseas in other countries have a more uh, – the way their worldview is, the way they view the faith over there is more of what we see in Scripture with them not having a building, with it being more organic in the way uh, they don't have one specific pastor. They don't have one specific person who's responsible. There's no hierarchy. What we see in the places that are actually being persecuted – is more of a true model of what we see in actual scripture. Mm-hmm. So let's go ahead and take a break, and on the other side, we'll do that. Go ahead, Jonathan. Before you get that break, I want to talk about that, because you can see when the church is being persecuted, the church thrives. Mm. And you can see that clearly in scripture. While the, pers- the church is being persecuted, it grows. the church yes. grew and thrived and survived. And I'm not even saying church. When the ecclesia was being persecuted, the ecclesia Thrived and grew, but now here, here in America or in the West, or, I, I'm not gonna say that. How about when you have the advent of Constantine when he came in and made the church, the ecclesia, well, not ecclesia still lives on. He made the church a part of a political entity, mm. and you can start seeing the downward trend or away from it. So the persecution kind of slacked off. So that's when the word started getting uh, diluted and such, just to use that. And you Bro, hold them, hold them thoughts. Ahead, hold them thoughts, because you're, right. you're about to teach. Hold I them. <laughs> All right. Yo, you listen to Real Talk Radio, man. Today we are talking about the, the Western American church view, Christian view. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, man, you're more than willing to call in, 661-449-9951 if you want to talk to the host. Please press one, and we'll gladly put you on the air to let you, uh, you know, talk about the subject that we're dealing with or whatever else is on your mind. So stay with us right after the break. We'll be back with more Real Talk Radio.
<laughs> you don't like that song? I just don't really care for Fred. Okay, I like well, I hear crickets. <laughs> <laughs> I just, like, got quiet I, I, just, said that. I just like the yeah. song, bro. I mean, because I, I don't want to, you know what I mean? I got you. Sound like I'm lifting Fred up, bro. You know, I don't, <laughs> don't feel like I'm jocking Fred. You know, I don't, don't want to get nobody that impression. You I just like the song. Fred Hammond, that's all. I just like the song. <laughs> I got you. I just okay, think. yeah, because you ain't going to have me looking like I'm, you know what I mean, riding Fred's back or nothing like that, bro. Nah, that's, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. But, hey. Welcome back to Real Talk Radio, man. Uh, the show that says just because you don't attend with them does not mean that you're not in him, the in him being Jesus. Today we are talking about the westernized, Americanized church view uh, or Christian view. Uh, before we went to the break, we began to talk about how those who are in other countries being persecuted tend to resemble more of what we see in Scripture by the way they're growing and thriving spiritually. One of the things that I think we often throw out terms on the show that sometimes we can just say we feel like since people have heard us before, they know exactly what we're talking about. But, Jonathan, one of the things I want you to talk about just real briefly, man, because you do such an excellent job breaking this down, is the difference between what we hear people say the church and the ecclesia before we go ahead and deal with the persecution aspect. Uh, so break that down for me, brother. You know, it, it's, and, and this is, like you said earlier in the show, it's very difficult for people to grasp this because of their worldview and their, the way they read Scripture. But, you know, it in in the, your Bible, in your English Bible, and we want to talk about that too, how we look at the Bible, the King James Version per se, but in your Bible, most uh, I'll say 99% of our English translated Bibles, wherever you see the word church, the Greek word there is ecclesia. Now, you also see the word ecclesia, I think it's Acts 19, mm-hmm. uh, where they translate it properly as assembly. They is translated properly. But everywhere else you see the word ecclesia, they use the word church. Now, church is the building. Church is, by definition, uh, a house dedicated to God. That's what the church is. We like to say that we're the church. I don't call myself the church. I call myself the ecclesia. I am a member of the body of Christ. So your church building is not a member of the body of Christ. It is a church building. But it's hard to grasp if you've never really studied it. And if you want to be real with yourself, when you research it, and I suggest you do research it, the meaning of the word church and the meaning of the word ecclesia. And you will see a big difference. Uh, like we were talking about earlier, how he talked about the church of Corinth, really said the ecclesia, the assembly, or the body of Christians that were in the city of Corinth. Not that building, not a particular building. Um, so you, you can look at it that way, the ecclesia versus the church. The plea is the body of Christ. The church is the building itself. You Christian are not the church, as we like to say. People it's a play on words, it mean the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. It's not. But, right. mm-hmm. Go ahead. Hey, no, that was good. Hey, go ahead, John. I know you want to add on. Go ahead. Excuse me. Uh I was just gonna go back to since he explained that as we're gonna talk about uh the persecution and how we how we view church growth. We view church growth through bigger buildings, and I'm talking about we in a westernized culture. Bigger buildings, more people, um, you know, the fancy fancy things, you know, the best audio equipment, the best visual equipment, you know, the best sermons. That's how we view church growth, through body count and things. Mm-hmm. But Real growth within the body is members being added to the body through spiritual rebirth. And when we look at the persecution that happens, like uh, when the, uh, we were talking about when uh, when Paul started persecuting the church, or we even saw it then when he started persecuting the church, and what they did was scatter the believers. 
And as the believers scattered, they took those beliefs with them, and they began to spread that. Uh, the belief they began to spread uh, Christ, mm. per se. And that's how it grows. That's how the church, the the body, really grows. But if you isolate it in one building, and we see this, we want to go out and bring people into our building to make our building bigger. Thereby, that's how we view church growth. Our congregation is getting bigger. Second Baptist congregation is, is getting bigger. Not the body of Christ, the Second Baptist congregation. That's how we view church growth. Which is completely polar opposite the way you just described it to what Scripture says. Scripture doesn't describe church growth in those terms whatsoever. Uh, and it's really amazing that we often see this thing where people want to hold on to the solution aspect of saying, okay, so what about the new believer? What about the babes in Christ? We have to have a place to send them. Again, it goes right back to the same mindset. We're looking for a specific place to send them. Where you send them is nowhere. The Holy Spirit will send them to a person who should be discipling them. So it won't be a place. It will be a group of people who will be doing that thing. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a completely different mindset. And once we begin to detox and deconstruct it from this church view that we have, we'll begin to see things. And, and bruh, the freedom in knowing that I don't have to find – look, chase after, be at, that I can just rely on the Holy Spirit is such so much peace and joy in it that the faith, all I got to do is just trust God, which we always want to tell people that they should be doing, but then we say you got to trust God and go here. You got to trust God and do this. You're adding something mm -hmm. to the trust God when trusting God should be all that you need. Mm -hmm. yep. And when you think about uh, that, when we think about the gifts of the Spirit, that was given to the body for edification, and we talk about the uh, evangelist and what he does. He goes out and preaches the gospel. The evangelist really, his his job really isn't, or his function, his or her function, is not uh, to really discipleship. While he should disciple people, those around him, those close to him, but that's not the evangelist's primary function. Um, that could be functions of a pastor or a teacher. Mm -hmm. To do discipleship, but the evangelist isn't doesn't really have that function. They're just to declare the gospel, to go out there and preach, and somebody else in that area will another person can disciple that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because I actually read a paper it was called "Biblical Church Growth: How to Grow Your Church Biblically." Now, oh, Jesus. And, and, and if you ask most pastors, like, how's your church growing, how's your church doing, and so the church is growing, they tend to measure church growth by the number of members yes, from, compared from that one time period to another time, the number of members, or the number of, uh, or even actually, if you ask the pastor, how's your church growing spiritually, they will measure that by people's participation in programs or their attendance because they really don't know how people are growing spiritually because, and, and I'm speaking generally here, because a lot of times they don't really give people opportunity to do things because you have a set amount of people, quote unquote, clergy, who does most of the work and nobody else is really getting an opportunity to do that either because of lack of attendance, lack of participation in programs. So they're not giving. So they don't really know how the church is growing spiritually. So when we say, as the church is growing spiritually, you can't really answer that. And, and But when you think about it, bruh, in a persecuted, an actual place where there's persecution that's being taken place, where it's not guaranteed that every week somebody is going to show up. So your worship leader may not show up every Sunday overseas because 
he got held up. He got arrested. He got whatever. He's facing real persecution. So you cannot give people a specific title or responsibility. It's really truly organic, meaning that the people who show up are the ones who are going to be the ones who may be the one who are actually leading the specific teaching that day. They all sing worship songs together. You cannot trust that certain people are going to be there because of the persecution that they're facing. So you can't give uh, Tommy, whoever, the pastor role because Tommy's family might get destroyed. They might get killed, so he might not be able to show up for that secret service. But we have it in this mindset in our culture that we have to assign people specific titles and, again, titles, not allowing them to work in their gifting, is two different things. We're, we're, not, we're not saying, you know, they shouldn't be gifting and doing these things. We're saying the titles in the persecuted church, the actual persecution that we're seeing, you're not seeing these type of things that we have going on here. And if they are still thriving spiritually, I, I, I'm not understanding how we're so quick to reject persecution. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that we should be welcoming persecution with open arms either. Christ said mm-hmm. that we should sign up for persecution mm-hmm. either. But I'm saying we have such a misguided, misinformed view of persecution, which directly links up with our arrogance based off of who we are. We have to acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. We too yeah. good for this. Let's, let's, who did it? Who do they think let's, they let's, are? Let's shift the, mm-hmm. Go ahead, Jonathan. I say let's shift the focus a little bit because um, as you were saying something we, earlier about this um, back to church Sunday, today is National Back to Church Sunday Day. Let's talk about that for a minute and how that our worldview affects that. To somebody even make up that statement, you were telling me a little bit about the website. Go ahead and expound on that a little bit. Well, today is, and you see how it just kind of shifted my attitude and shifted and kind of mm-hmm. pushed in a downward spiral. Uh, today is National Back to Church Sunday. With this movement, this there's a website out there, and it's actually called backtochurch.com. That's backtochurch.com, all one word, that is uh, advertising different ways. They actually have a Back to Church Sunday video contest where, based off of the number of people that you have gathering today, uh, if you videotape it and you're creative with your video, they you will win their contest. But on a particular page of this website, they actually have – different videos that you can purchase that you can show during your service as a way of giving people ideas on how to get your friends and family to come to church. Hmm. And these videos actually cost. They cost anywhere from 20 to $40 mm-hmm. uh, for the video to get people to come back to church. Now, if you win the actual video contest, you have the ability to win cash and prizes. On the website, you can add your church to the Back to Church uh, Sunday movement. You can find a church. Uh, There was actually a video on YouTube where there was a group of guys who were rapping a song about coming back to church. And you had all different types of people. You had an older white dude who was rapping about a mega church. You had a black dude who was, you know, doing Afrocentric black dances uh, to get people excited about coming back to church. You had an older chubby white guy who was rapping about how you can come to a small church if you like that feel. But it was all geared towards uh, inviting people back to church. There's over 22,000 churches that are listed on this website to get people to come back to church. Mm-hmm. Now, my question for the, the question that somebody is, is saying right now is, what's wrong with that? What, what, what's, what's wrong with having a back to church movement? What's wrong with having a natural national back to church? day. Fellas, what is wrong with having 
National Back to Church Day? Uh, how about having a National Back to Jesus Day? <laughs> well, but, you know, have a, a if you have Jesus people come to church, you know, they'll hear Jesus. Oh, really? Okay, so what about when they get there? Are you going to be able to keep them? When they get there? Sure. Just asking. Just asking. National come back to church day, as if church is the answer. As if church, the place where you go, is the end all be all. We got them back in church now. Now we can get saved. So what the scripture says, go. But they say, come. So which which one? I mean, which one should we do? Should we go as the scripture teaches, or should we have people come to us? As the world teaches, you know, I'm saying where I'm talking about the system. Hmm. So here, here's my here's my issue with the thing. Uh, we talking about going back to church or a national back to church day. Um, when we do invite people to church, what is the motive? Is it for really a membership drive? Or is it really about getting sold? And they will tell you that it's about sold. And most of the time, they're probably sincere. But it really is not. It's about continuing to help the machine work, to help the machine keep going, to keep these parts into the system, to help the system work and to function. Because without the people, the, the system don't fall. So it's, it's, it's really about uh, church growth. And we talked about earlier what is church growth, and I'm talking about the system and the building getting more people inside. It's the membership drive. And we ask about what is the motivation for that. Now, there's a saying out there, it's not biblical, the road to hell is paved with good intention. They may have good intentions, but do they work? And when we get people into church, we get them busy doing church work and believing that church work is the same thing or equivalent to to uh, serving Christ, doing what Christ will have you to do, which is to go out and, you know, be his representative here on this earth, feeding the poor, doing good work. Not that those good works don't get you into heaven, but doing that. And then someone will bring up the point, well, my church does that. So why do you need the church to do it? Why can't you do it yourself? Invite on the church to do everything. There you go. And that's, that's exactly the path that I'm headed down. Christians don't need church. The church needs Christians. Because Mm-mm. without Christians, there is no church. You, Christian, who are listening, you do not need the church. The church needs you. Because without you, it is not able to sustain itself, which is the exact opposite of a Christian. Without a church, a Christian is able to sustain, be sustained because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Without the church, with, without you Christians, your church will fall. That's one of the reasons why we see them constantly uh, manipulating people for money, whether it be intentionally or unintentionally, because we're not going to throw blanket statements out there and say that every church that preaches tithing and you know money schemes are intentionally trying to manipulate people out of their cash. But if you don't come, there's no one there to pay the light bill. There's no one paid to the, the, the gas bill. The doors are shut down, the mortgage, all these things. There's no place now. Without you, the system falls. You, Christian, do not need the church. The church needs you. You will survive. You will grow and thrive in your freedom from the church. The church cannot survive without you. And that's a really a difficult thing for people who are in the church, 
or still have a church-like mindset to grasp and to swallow. That is probably one of the most offensive things that a person could possibly hear someone say. But the problem that I often have is when a Christian finds out that I'm a Christian, the number one question they always want to ask me when they find out I'm a question is what a, a Christian is what? What, what church do you do? attend? Mm-hmm. What church do I attend? And when I say none, the number one response that they give is, "You need to find a good church home, a Bible teaching, a good Bible believing <laughs> church." You hurt. Now, how you come you the hurt. response is not? How are you growing spiritually? How how is your spiritual life? Well, why can't it be? Why is it that focus, fellas? And I mean that's just rhetorical, but that's the mindset that we deal with. Mm-hmm. And, and I want to, you know, and it, it all blends in. The, something you talked about earlier, how people want to be comfortable. A lot of people ain't gonna be comfortable in these other countries. They're not comfortable, but we have to be comfortable. Well, you gotta give your money because. How the lights going to stay on? You just talked about that. You know, just to reiterate a little bit. How the bills going to get paid? You know, we got to have a nice, comfortable. Our pews got to be nice and comfortable. I, my butt can't be hurting when I go hear the word of God. I can't be uncomfortable hearing the word of God. I got to be comfortable. So we got to have this nice building to meet in. But that's just our world view. It's not the rest of the world's world view. Like Elder talked about earlier, you got people meeting at 3 a.m. Because that's the only time they can meet and fellowship with one another about Christ. That's it. Mm-hmm. That, that's the only time. But we tend to think that they're wrong if, if they don't do it, they don't meet on Sunday. Uh, it's just it's the arrogant aspect, this this sense of entitlement. Well, my church better have this. You know, they they better have air. I'm one of them. They got them old fans with the funeral home and Martin Luther King funeral home on one side and Martin Luther King on the other side. You know, so I'm uncomfortable. I ain't going to this church. They air broke. I ain't going down there. And they choir can't sing. So that church ain't got it. The pastor don't really preach. There ain't no anointing there. Because, you know, I don't get goosebumps when I go. So, you know, something wrong with that church. That church ain't loud. That's a dead church. That's mm. a dead church. All they do is stand up and sit down. Pastors don't even who he just like talk when he preaching. They they dead. They don't know how to have church. Mm-hmm. Ain't no spirit but you go in that somewhere church. else. But that's just the worldview that the American or uh, Westernized person has. That's it, man. I, I, how do you get around that? How do you mm-hmm. how do you talk to someone about the truth of their lenses? I, I, all we can you can really do is is, is, is plant the seed, man. I was going to say, even, it's an impossible even, conversation. But even within the, the Western worldview, there's even different worldviews. Because what you just said about, oh, that pastor don't hoop and holler, uh, they don't shout, there's no spirit in that church. That's even a, a worldview within the Western worldview because um, you have the the more like reformed churches where they do a lot more teaching. Um, Coming I mean, there, they go to a, a a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church, they say, "Why? What are they doing? Why are they doing all this screaming and hollering? And who? Why are they doing all that?" Because you have that too. They doing too much. And others say, "You ain't doing enough." They wrong. I'm right. Mm. Mm. Man, man, we got a lot of growing to do, man. We got a lot of growing. And the, the problem is, bro. Folks are not going to grow if they don't even realize that they're not growing. Some yeah. people don't even realize that this is an issue. This and and for some who are listening, this this is not an issue for them because this is not a big deal for them. Why are we even bothering having this discussion? You know, and then they want us to provide all of the the answers for every issue that we discuss, and that's just not reality. But here's here's the thing. This is a growing battle that we who have different views that go counter go counter to what the culture states, the Christian culture. Because most of the views that you're going to hear from Real Talk Radio goes against what the church system puts out there. We we, we mm-hmm. challenge it with scripture, and but 
we are at a place where we understand what our role and responsibility is. Our role and responsibility is not to destroy, tear down, blow up the system. Our responsibility is to provide truth about Scripture. And even our topics are not attacks against the system. It just sometimes happens that most of the topics that we come up with are topics that the church system are teaching in error. It's not an Mm -hmm. intentional thing. But when you're dealing with the spiritual arrogance of this, just as simple as what was described of the AC and the heat, or making sure that you have soft cushions on your pews, the sense of entitlement. When you have people in other countries who don't have that type of luxury, Mm -hmm. there's something wrong with that mindset when other things begin to become the focus instead of Jesus being the focus. And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. in most of the churches today, Jesus is the sprinkle on top of their man-made Sunday. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Jesus is in there. But he, word. He's, just, he's just a, you know, a sprinkle of top. It has very little to do with him. Right. Now, he the should worship be the songs. He should be the Man, he should be the whole doggone thing. <laughs> From the worship, you know, the worship is man-centered. It's all about making you feel good. It's all about, you know, getting you stirred up and fired up. The preaching is, is watered down. It's some... Uh, Moralistic life application stuff where people want to say, you know, this is how you defeat the, the Goliaths in your life. This is just, you, you know, you can be just like Rahab. You can be a, a whore, but God can still use you. It, it, it can be, well, you're suffering. You're just like Job, and God will bless you the same way He blessed Job in the end. Or you can be like Paul, or murderer, and it, it, it's it's all about life application. How there are morals in each of these biblical stories. When the truth of the matter is, Scripture in itself is all about Jesus. But when you take it into this church view, it, it's 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 all about us. So when you talk about what is an unbiblical church, an unbiblical church is when a church is focused on you and your issues instead of being about Christ. Mm. People ain't going to like that. Well, they don't like a lot of stuff we say. Mm. But it, like I I mean, it all boils down to how you view the scriptures. Like, you know, like I told one of my friends, you know, the scriptures haven't changed. It's just my understanding of the scriptures. Of That's the good. scriptures have changed. So you need to get another understanding. Like, yeah, we're talking about paradigm shift. And I, and I really don't like saying that you need to <laughs> or you should do. And I hate that because it comes across as uh, arrogant. Yes. It comes across as me being spiritually superior to you to say that I know it and you don't. So you need to get under. What you need to do is pray. <laughs> And ask God there you to go again, you. telling somebody what they need to do. Yeah, I know I did that on purpose. <laughs> we do need to pray, right? See, there you go. Exactly, yeah, you need to pray. But I hate that. People, you know, you're on Facebook and people commenting and you're being nice and cordial. And they say, well, you need to get a better understanding or you need to really study. I don't I don't hate telling people that. You need to consider what they need to do. You know, I like you ask questions. I'm going to ask you some uh, questions. Let's... Can you answer that's what we do. Ask questions. Like <laughs> it ain't my responsibility to answer the questions. Now I can share you the truth that I have, but then even the truth that I have, I want you to question the truth that I have to make sure that my truth is true. Yeah, go in on your own. <laughs> so, for instance, what we mean by your under, different understanding? There's a scripture that says, uh, "Oh my God!" What well, is it, the one? I think it's in Mark 11 where it talks about Jesus said, "If you ask anything according to His will, it'll be done." Mm, mm, mm. So you know, <laughs> reading that scripture through the lens or through the worldview of the word faith, you said I can have whatever I want, no matter what it is. All I got to do is ask Him and believe in faith in His mind. 
Okay, now let's read it through another worldview, uh, a biblical worldview, a true biblical worldview, without the lens of uh, word of faith. And you notice, you know, he's, what he's talking about is you do it according to his will, if it's in his will. Because if you just take that literally, and, and, and uh, I heard it once, somebody was explaining how it talks about if you take that, you know, you can have whatever you want. Ask, you know, you do it in faith and believe that you can have it. So I want my boss to die because I want his job. So I pray diligently. I fast. I seek his face for my boss to die. But the scriptures say if I ask in his name, you know, and believe it, that it shall be done. So now I've done all this, and now I'm waiting on my boss to die. You think God's going to kill my boss just because I prayed it and I believed that it would be done? She, it ain't adding up, is it? It no, don't add up. So you just want to you know, get a different understanding of what the scripture is really saying. Read it in context. You know, you, so your understanding is different. I, guess, I think it's Matthew where it talks about how Jesus opened up the, under, the, the disciples understand that they might comprehend the scriptures. Now, this was right before his ascension. And note that the disciples walked with the word. They walked with Jesus for three years, and they still didn't have a good understanding until he opened their understanding that they may comprehend the scripture. So don't think that just because you have this, there's something wrong with you, that you're out of bounds or whatever, because maybe he just hasn't opened your understanding. So if you want to pray for anything, pray that he open your understanding, that you may be able to comprehend the scriptures in their proper place, in their proper context, in their proper time frame, cultural time frame, and who is it talking to, what they were talking to. And I guarantee you, that you will look at the scripture differently, you'll look at everything differently. You start to question some of the practices that you practice and call it serving God and working for God. You start to question a lot of stuff, man. You're getting off my soapbox. No, I just think that just we don't see, man, and I know we keep reiterating and harping on that aspect because I really want to hammer some of this stuff home uh, how arrogant we have become as a culture and how arrogant the church culture is and for me one of the, the great images of how arrogant we have become is how other countries have begun to accept it and received false doctrine as a way of getting out of their issues. And when we think about these African countries who are uh, reinforcing this word of faith foolishness that we're seeing taking place here in our country and beginning to do the very same thing in their countries to poor and impoverished people, it's, it blows my mind how there is this TBN mindset that is taking place within these poor African countries where they are teaching people that in order for them to be financially blessed, that they must give their finances, which is a complete Oxymoron. It's, it's, it's nuts to tell somebody, yo, know, in order for you to come out of your poverty, give your last. You already broke, but that little bit of change you got, God will bless that, flip that, and give it to you tenfold, a hundredfold, if you by faith give your last. Mm -hmm. they, 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 and they have accepted this mindset, man. These countries have accepted this false gospel that it's is being it, perpetuated it through. Yeah, it, exactly. But we, we know that's what they're really saying. But do you have these people who are doing it? And that is a problem, man. In our arrogance, we don't even see how what we're doing over here is affecting other countries. That's because they don't matter. Because the only thing matters is what we're doing right here, right now. We're not concerned about what's going on outside of these this uh, contiguous United States of America, or however you say it. 
the continuous mm-hmm. conus. It, it don't matter because all we think about is us. We are uh, we are kind of like Sodom. We have the uh, oh Jesus the idleness mm-hmm. of time and the fullness of bread. You know we don't take care of the poor. Uh, I mean Tupac. And one of his songs said, we got money for war, but can't feed the poor. I mean, how serious is that? I mean, how, how truthful is that? Yeah. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. We got all this freedom, all this time, all this money, and we're just, you know, busy piling up more stuff for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um it's 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 disheartening, man. Just to see, and and sometimes I just feel helpless. You know, I you can warn the people all you want. Feel like you know how Noah felt. You warn the people, warning them, warning them. But it's like it's like nobody listens. I think some people are listening. Some people are getting it. Um, so I, I you know I think we should keep doing what we're doing, man. Just no matter how many people, how many hateful emails we get. It don't matter. You know, I think we still need to keep doing it because somebody's going to get it. Somebody's waking up. More, more people, more and more people are waking up, and they need, they're going to need somebody to listen to or uh, somebody to reach out to, and I just want to be there for them if and when it happens. So. Yeah. That's all we can do. I mean, again, I mean, next week's show, and I just want to give a little time for that because I think we've, done a great job with the topic today. We agreed that we can kind of, okay. Next week's show is a topic that kind of fits in with a lot of the topics that we have been dealing with here that really is going to be one that I think is going to uh, be a light bulb moment for a lot of people. We're going to talk about church peer pressure, uh, and that is the pressure that the church system, the people within it, the way it's set up, how it pressures people to stay, to come, to give, all those things. And I think it's really going to blow people's minds and open people's eyes because they, I don't think people realize how much pressure is applied, even within the, the westernized context, to practice Christianity. Mm-hmm. How America is proclaimed to be a so-called Christian nation, that that mm-hmm. America, you know, Christianity is the American religion. How, even as far as how we discriminate against other religions that don't practice Christianity within our country, when we proclaim to say that you have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom of religion, but if you don't practice Christianity, you don't have the same type of freedoms that Christians have. You can't have it both ways, but how we even apply that type of peer pressure onto other people. So that's one of the things, and then we were talking, uh, I think it was this morning, about the peer pressure that we have faced because we still deal with people who are within the church culture. We have loved ones who have gone to church today, who have gotten dressed and who are underneath that type of peer pressure, who don't see things the way we see. And we're not asking people to see things the way Elgin sees it. Please, because some of the things that Elgin sees is absolutely nuts. Just mm-hmm. <laughs> just don't, don't do what we do. We ain't asking you to be uh, Real Talk Radio. We're asking you to search the scriptures for yourself, to spend time with the Holy Spirit, to allow him to open your eyes and reveal things for yourself, to trust him. You don't need more faith because God has given you enough faith. You don't need more Christ because you're complete in him. You don't need the church because you have the body of Christ. We're trying to understand that it's not the same. You don't have to fall into the peer pressure. And I ask people all the time, what motivates you to go to church? Not stop going, not don't go, but what motivates you to do these things? What motivates us to do Real Talk Radio? Because we want to see people walk in their true identity in Christ. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, man. So look like we're probably coming to a close of this show. Um, so what's yes. your final thoughts, Elder? Oh, hold on. We did Jonathan, you still there? Yeah. Didn't you want to talk about the different Bible translations? I know you oh, have to yeah, you didn't really get into it. Yeah, you ain't go deep. We got some time. Go ahead and deal with that. Okay, bro. yeah, I wanted to talk about how, you know, with with, with our arrogance and, and, and our world view as we think that the King James authorized version is the only version that we should read. As if our English version is the best. It's the best in the world. But it was it's, it, the language <clears throat> Old Testament is Hebrew. New Testament is, is in Greek. So we just have English translation. So some of the words like we were talking about church. Uh, the word church or the word ecclesia, if you go to uh, uh, another country, let's say you go get your Russian Bible, mm-hmm. would ecclesia of Greek be translated as church or would it be translated as some? Now, I'm not talking about uh, it may be because uh, Catholics, you know, they were over in Germany or Russia, wherever. You know, it just depends. But some of the words that we have that were translated from Greek, and we know that there's mistranslations, like Hebrews 13, 17. I love that mistranslation. It's so good to debunk that when they talk about obey them and have the rule over you. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you were to translate that in Russian or German, would it say obey or would it say be persuaded by? And will they even have these divisions that we have? Like we have the chapter, verse, and all these different things with our, uh, I guess, the editors or the printers, a lot of that with their preferences, even how our English is broken down with commas or punctuation. For example, where Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, depending on where that comma is, he said, today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. Or today, wait, I, I cannot, assuredly, I say unto you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. Or surely I say unto you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. So depending on where that comma is, one is saying, you're going to be with me in paradise today, or I'm telling you today, that you're going to be with me in paradise. just depends on, it gives a different meaning, depending on where that comma is put. So different punctuations, even in our language, if people don't even look, what do you mean punctuation? And I can break that down a little further if anybody needs, you know, how I said today. But just that, those punctuations, you translate it from another language, from Greek into Russian or Greek into Chinese or Greek even Spanish, you know, do you get those same meanings? But we think that we got it right. We got the authorized King James Version. And if you use anything else, something wrong with you. You see what I'm saying? So that that's another casualty of the American or Westernized worldview. Feel me? Absolutely. I, I, and that's mm-hmm. a very, very good point, man. And I, don't, I think it's one that we don't examine deep enough. Mm-hmm. How it, man, how it affects our view of things. Red letter, red Jesus, red letters. Man, that's that's an uh, editor's choice, preference. He chose to put Jesus words in red. Let me tell you, if you are a red letter Christian, you might want to get your head examined, because I'm telling you, if you are trying to follow everything that Jesus said to do, you are in error, because everything that Jesus said to do, everything he said wasn't talking to you, the believer. Who are on this mm-hmm. side of the cross mm-hmm. But we have to be able to read scripture The right way And that's been one of the great failures Of the church system Is that they have not taught people How to read scripture in context That discipleship essentially Is non-existent man. And here's here's my, my point that On my closing summary Of the show And I want to highlight one aspect That we really talked about and that's the National Back to Church Sunday. My summary is, instead of having National Back to Church Sunday, they should have National The Church is Closed Day Summary, Go Out and Disciple Somebody Day. 
meaning we're not going to have church today. I need you to do something else for somebody else. So instead of you giving me your money and tithing offering, how about you go pay somebody's light bill? How about you help that person who doesn't have enough gas money to get to work this week? Give them your money. Instead of you coming in and bringing your dishes here for a potluck, how about you go into the community to that single mother who has more than one child that she's struggling to take care of, how about you provide something for them? How about you actually go out and do what Jesus said instead of doing what man has said? We're going to shut our doors today. Matter of fact, church is not going to be open today. We're going to go do something else. We're going to go model Christ. But instead of this mindset of going to have you come here, I want you guys as a shepherd, because it's my responsibility to teach the right thing as a shepherd, Go out and do something that Jesus said instead of what Elgin said today. Oh, but I got you, Elgin. We'll go out. We'll shut the door. But we're just going to hand out flyers and invite people to come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we're That's mission was. So that would be my summary. John? Yeah, I just wanted to say in my summary um, that we just need to be cognizant and aware that we are not the uh, end-all, be-all of Christianity uh, in the world. And the sooner we recognize that, the better off we be. And it don't just have to be about Christianity. That can just be about anything. Um, just the, the American worldview about, about anything, about politics, about sports, democracy, whatever it is. Um, but since the context of the show, we're talking about the church system and how we view that. Um, we just need to recognize and understand that just because you don't attend with them does not does not mean that you're not in him, that him being Jesus. That's all I got to say. I got it right this time. <laughs> yeah, you got it right. My closing statement will be, God bless America. <laughs> no, you're talking about Darren King? Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm talking about God blessing America. Oh. You know, you know this is God's favorite country. This is God's country. You know, it's his favorite country. So God bless America. So let me let me ask you. I know we we closing out, but like when y'all at a ball game or something, they do the pledge of allegiance. Do y'all pledge allegiance? Put your hand on the heart and say the pledge of allegiance. I don't. Uh, I have. I don't do it all the time. Sometimes I'm just tired. Don't feel like put my hand up. To be honest with you, I mean, I don't think too much yeah. about it. Do you, John? No, I don't. When you don't do it, Jonathan and Elgin, do you feel some type of way? I don't. Me either. Yeah, it's yeah. not something I really can think about, actually, to be honest with you. No, okay. Actually, you know, I, my I, man be on, my man be on the band, like, because, uh, you know, I used to go to the football game, you know, the metric football games and whatnot. I've been listening to the band, play the Star Spangled Band. I've been trying to see if they're going to make some high notes or whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> mm. hey, you I know, because I do, I, being where I work at, you know, it's, uh, you know, patriotism is real high where I work at. So, you know, I'm around it all the time. But it's funny because I'll just sit there and people look at me like I'm crazy. Just Nobody ever say nothing to me. But mm. I'm going to be talking about me. I don't care. They be persecuting me. <laughs> I'm patriotic. I don't put my hand on my heart. They be they be persecuting me. Uh, <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, this dude said he be persecuting me. I ain't persecuting me. Just put your hand on your heart. Say what? I ain't well, we done said some stuff. We done said some stuff on the show today, boy, that I know that made some folk mad. Lord. Gonna kick, that's they going to kick you out of about. America. They sure are. This ain't this ain't God's chosen country. Christians don't need church. Everything that Jesus said it wasn't for you. <laughs> Boy, we we, we, we don't lit a fire in this boat today. You know, I don't say the pledge of allegiance. Somebody gonna be mad that I, I put a little little vanilla and cinnamon in my coffee. Watch out! Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't even drink yeah, coffee. Yeah. What? You don't drink Your coffee. Your anointing has just left the building. <laughs> <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen This is the closing of our show At this time the doors of the church Are now open 
Uh, let all hearts and minds be clear. This is the time that we would normally present the gospel to people to come to Christ. No, we're not doing that. That's, we're just being completely facetious. Uh, but this is the end of Real Talk Radio for this week, man. Next week we are going to be dealing with church peer pressure. Um, yeah, just pressure to perform, pressure to perform, man. And mm. I really encourage those who might be listening to us for the first or second time to go back in our archives and listen to some of our shows. We have a show where we clearly have presented the gospel, where we have dealt with the context of scripture the church building. So a lot of the stuff that we've said on today's show and other shows are things that we have covered with some depth to it. So we're not just throwing things out there. So it wouldn't, you know, behoove you to go back into our archives and check some of the stuff out that we've dealt with in the past. And feel free free, man, to hit us up. We we would love to dialogue with you. You might not like Mm -hmm. us, but you're both welcome to listen. But, John, go ahead and pray us out, bro, please. Jesus wept. Amen. Mm, he sure did. Watch out. Ooh, I felt the spirit. <laughs> you ain't going to pray? I just did. Oh, so you ain't put my salvation in question without no prayer at the end of the show, bro. I, I'll tell you that. All right. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, till next week, man. We out. Thank you for checking out this episode of Real Talk Radio. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Or drop us online at 4realtalkradio at gmail.com. That's the number 4, realtalkradio at gmail.com. Man, send your comments, concerns, criticisms, or show ideas. We would love to hear from you. Till next week, we out. Yeah, we know some of y'all who are listening are mad right now.